Oh, good afternoon. Joe Weinberg, Bull Birth Semaphore. This will be World History for Ordinary People 30. And it's going to be more East Asia. And I'm going to start by going into one of the books I talked about last time. And that was the uh, Chinese literature and anthology from ancient times to, I think they said the Tang Dynasty. Ancient times. So I'm going to go to that because you would think that maybe what you're going to get is a lot of these uh, poems that the ancients used to write about how sweet the dew is on the on the morning leaves and so on and so forth. But I got into reading some of this ancient literature and I'm getting explanations from <clears throat> what went on in Asia, particularly the where we believe the civilization, the Chinese civilization, originated, which is, once again, in the big bend, the big curve in the Yellow uh, River, which is somewhere west, southwest, quite a ways from Beijing. But uh, when I say quite a ways, it certainly doesn't, I'm not talking about, you know, to the far reaches of China, no. Seems to be maybe, you know, 800, 700 miles southwest. The Big Bend in the Yellow River. Very important place. Now, so I'm reading this uh, ancient literature, and the particular author <coughs> is talking, and you get the sense that he's talking from way back, possibly as far back as 2000 BC and maybe even more, who knows? Because uh, they only were recording history from 1700 BC. So he's writing, but you definitely get the sense on the preliminary write up to this and what the guy is saying, that this is seriously ancient stuff he's talking about. And what he's talking about is that around that area that I just talked about, around the Yellow River, which was the, the heartland of Chinese civilization. They decided at the time this, this land was all swamps and estuaries. Swamps and estuaries. You get the picture with a big river cutting through it. So they decide they are going to drain the swamps, drain the estuaries, and make that river fall and flow like a river is supposed to flow. Okay, so they do that, and they're successful. They do come up with dry land, in other words, land that's not inundated. But what did they create? They created China's sorrow, which is the fact that every couple of years, in the spring, the, the melting snows and the gushing rains caused that river to overflow its banks in such a fashion that sometimes millions of people were killed. Villages were destroyed. And more, more currently, massive evacuations had to take place so they could build dams to try to get that under control. China's sorrow. Now, of course, that's it happened in other places. Uh, China's not the only one to do such a thing, to drain swamps and estuaries. They did that in Mesopotamia, and as far as I know, not without too much uh, <clears throat> harm to the population. Although there's, there is evidence that, that river, those rivers flew over their banks, or flowed over their banks significantly. There, there is archeological and geological evidence of that. But what finally did it for them, as far as uh, these uh, areas that had, been, that had been mitigated by human development, in other words, the uh, people in that area had drained the swamps and the estuaries 
to make those uh, Euphrates and the Tigris fertile valleys. They did that. But then along came one of the Mongol Khans who he was given the uh, task to subdue Persia and Arabian Peninsula and th th that part of the world. So he's doing his conquering and then as a final gesture to those folks, he destroys the, uh, <clears throat> the drainage works and turn that area into an arid kind of desert-like place. So uh, humans did something and then it still didn't work out for them. Same thing in China. It didn't work out for them. So, uh, and my, one of my points here is that if you're, you're reading literature and you, you think you're getting literature, you're really also getting in-depth histories. Very useful to thinking about how these lands and these nations played out. So, I've kind of put that book aside and I continue to read about the, the Far East and Mongolia is considered part of the Far East. And last time I talked about Mongolian women giving leadership, ruling type positions. So I came across the fact that one of Genghis Khan's daughters, or granddaughters, I always get this confused, but uh, there were people up there, the Ulits, something in the same general area, which was the ancestral lands of the Mongols. In other words, scattered around like Baiko. There were about six or seven other different tribes that were like the <clears throat> the Mongols in their culture and, and how they 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 uh, they got their livelihood from the lands around Lake Baikal. And one of them was something like a Ure, Ureta. And those folks finally got to see that, you know, it would be better to join forces with the Mongols because eventually they're gonna, they're just gonna beat the, the living daylights out of us and they're gonna win and we're gonna be gone. So they join up with, with Genghis Khan. And this of course, all sponsored by Genghis Khan. And, and when that's, they're joined, he did this a lot. He would solidify these joinings by marrying off daughters and granddaughters and so on. And in this case, I think it was a daughter. He marries her, he marries her to one of the, the uh, sons, i.e. a prince of these Uruk people. And um, he, he instructs her at the wedding. Now you go there and you lead these people. There is no longer their rules or their laws. It will be your rules, your laws, how you see fit to rule these people. You will be the ruler. No, not your husband, not these other folks, you. But because he's a traditionalist, he also tells her, stay close to your mother-in-law, you know, don't slight her. But on the other hand, he takes her husband and to make sure he's not putting his finger in the pie, he assigns him the task of coming with him Genghis Khan, as Genghis Khan goes around raiding the world as it was known, okay? So that young lady, that young princess was a top leader. There was no secondary leader. She ruled, as did many other women in Mongolia. The story of, a, of one to come later, like a, uh, a wife of one of the Mongolian grand son cons and they all had these cons all had their little piece of the of the pie all over the place and she had so much wealth that when and she was in charge of this she was in charge of moving the whole encampment the whole that particular i think it was the golden house not the golden horde but the golden family which was the main family of Mong, of the mongols from their place in Lake Baikal region and then down, down, down to the other area where they would abide probably more in the winter and the Baikal more in the summer.
but she was in charge of this. And this is a feat of gargantuan proportions just to haul her stuff. And she had a lot of stuff. It took 20,000 carts, okay? And this caravan of that, that golden family was just totally spectacular. You can't imagine from one horizon to the other horizon, marching on, marching on in spectacular fashion. And in a certain way, you know, the, the other peoples out there, the merchants, who often were of Muslim or Islamic faith, and the Tartars, these were the merchants. And the men, the Mongol men, they didn't want anything to do with this uh, display of goods and, and you know, this, this superfluous things. But the women were buying into it, like they wanted the spices, they wanted the perfumes, they wanted the cloth that made fancy clothing. They, they wanted a lot of this stuff. So they persuaded their husbands. And the Mongols, you know, were starting to buy into uh, material culture. So, of course, when she moved, she needed 20,000 carts to move her stuff. And uh, the, the, um, the, the boys at the time, and the boys who were leaders of individual cons were always either a grandson, a son, a great, uh, a great grandson, you know, some, it had to be a blood tie with Genghis Khan, okay? And they had been dispersed over the four corners of the world. They were all over the place. They were in Central Asia, and this is, I mean, in a controlling fashion, Central Asia, Eastern Russia, uh, the Middle East, the Near East, uh, Arabia, India, and at the time I'm thinking of, particularly the, this time, I think, when the 20,000 cart went moving out of the, uh, <clears throat> the area of their ancestral home, uh, Kublai Khan, which was a grandson, and he wasn't high up on the list of who's going to take over someday, but he was a grandson, which made him a big deal. He was given the assignment to go down and take South China. And, and, he, and he does, and he does it in a marvelous fashion, but he takes this route that goes all the way uh, near India and then down and up into southern China. Now, we, don't, we, don't, we probably say, well, why? Well, some of it is just based on geography. And little did I know that uh, Tibet, you know, when, when I would think of Tibet, I would think of the Himalayas, come down the other side, there's Lasha, that's Tibet. No, it just starts there. Then there's the Grand Tibetan Plateau which goes on probably for a thousand miles. And then it slopes off and there's somewhat of a corridor there. And on the other side is the Gobi Desert. So, and then these writers are pointing out that the Silk Road took advantage of that particular corridor and other corridors. They had to follow natural uh, ways of getting from east to west to allow this commerce on the Silk Road to go by from all the way around the very eastern extremities of Europe to all the way to the Pacific in, in China. Okay, and it didn't, wasn't a straight line, it was up and down, this way and that way and all over. And, uh, <clears throat> and it, I still, to, to, to now, I, I really don't have how that was all mapped out, but I got a good insight, and you could try this. The, if you can get a satellite photo of Asia and Central Asia and Eastern Europe and even Europe and India, okay, if you can get that satellite photo at night, you will see the illuminated areas where there are greater congregations of people and they have lights. And the Silk Road was peppered with cities and towns, places of commerce for rest and rehabilitation, and then move on. And those oases, in some cases, those resting places, became the modern cities of today. 
And so in this photograph from the satellite, from high up in the satellite, down at night, you could trace human habitation. And where you see those lights, that's where the Silk Road was. And it still is. Now, because I had read a great deal about the Silk Road, when I saw that, boom, it was intuitively obvious that that had to be the Silk Road. And it, it's, 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 still, it's still a wonder, you know? And it's not like I've closed the door or closed a chapter on this. There's a lot more for me to know about the Silk Road, about Central Asia, about East Asia. It's unending, oh, it's just unending. But uh, to <clears throat> make sure that I haven't forgotten anything that I wanted to talk about today, one of the cons, he was a little different in, uh, in, in some of them. He, most, of, most of these cons, in other words, the people close to Genghis Khan, his sons, his grandsons, they were all of a raiding warrior mindset. That's what they wanted to do. But a few would want to understand they had inquisitive minds, and there were, there were men of, of scholarship that were they were starting to come in contact with. And this made these certain cons a little inquisitive. So one of them gets his, he, he's told, go out and you take or take uh, that part of Russia, which is just east of the Volga River, and maybe a little on the west too, Kiev, those kind of places, Norvorogod, and, and so on. And, um, we, you take that land over, and he does it. And he, he's up the Volga somewhere. That's where his cannonade is, cannonade. Uh, and uh, so you're looking here that the, these Russian folks, early pre-Russian folks, were subservient to these Mongols, to this Khan. And most of the people who became subservient to them there was about five cons doing the, these things at any given time. Uh, they knew it was, it was better for them <coughs> to submit. Because if you didn't submit, uh, the Mongols were just not going to let you continue. You were gone. You and your culture were gone. So they, they survived. And, and, and one of the things I found out is that the, the Russian migrations migrated into Russia, people, a great deal... They, they came from Sweden. So you could think of the Swedes migrating south over the rivers and eventually migrating into what today Russia. And they, uh, they probably are very uh, ancestral types to today's Russian folks. But the, the Russians have more history in their genealogy than uh, just the, the folks down from Sweden. But uh, you know, when you think of it, Sweden is right there, you know, on the fringe of all this Central Asia stuff. And, and there's no reason why they wouldn't have been pushing down into Central Asia because there's so much to be gained. You know, plus the Vikings were always coming down those rivers and so on. So uh, now when I do this, these talks, I'm doing all this from my head. I generally don't have any notes and I want to keep it like that. Because I believe unless it's in your head, you know, you really don't have it. And the, the concept for world history for ordinary people is that the people have it. They have it in their head. They have an understanding of what the past was. And at any given moment, they could think about it and even discuss it with somebody. So you, you don't see too many notes. Occasionally I'll write something on this thing. But uh, I try not to... Uh, do that, and, and I mentioned before, one of the cons, uh, he, he became large in Samarkand, I forget, oh well, yeah, he was Timor, Timor the Tired, the, the Tartar, Tamerlane, all the same person, but one of his sons or grandsons pressed on into uh, <clears throat> Northwest India and started the Mughal, Mughal Empire, which is just a a different way of saying Mongol. And I think I did mention that also. But repetition is good. It makes it sink in. 
and uh, I think I can bring world history <clears throat> for ordinary people number 30 to a close right now. <clears throat> I hope you enjoyed it. Um, at some point in time, I will try to wrap up East Asia. Now, I did, I did a painting, by the way. I showed you the one, the young girl uh, court, uh, what was the name of it? I got it here, hold on a second. Young girl, Grand Khan's Imperial Court Palace, East Asia. Now, I, did, I think I showed you that one, but I, I did another one. This is simply called Mongo Princesses, okay? So I'm going to show you that one if I can. You see it? Mongol princesses. The other one, the one with the, uh, which I said was the young girl. I don't know if you can see it there. This young girl, Great Khan's court. It's hiding behind a few others. So uh, I just want you to know that as I'm concentrating on East Asia, I am also trying to make a few paintings because I did say I would have the East Asia project that would have these paintings. And so far, I have <clears throat> racked up nine of these, which is can be looked at as more or less a historical statement, a fantasized statement, no doubt, but it's like a historical statement. So uh, the East Asia Project, and this is what the name is, and I showed them all to you. Shanghai No More, Foreign Lady, Silk costumes of East Asia, Chinese lanterns on East Lake, Yin and Yang of East Asia, Xanadu, in ancient Persia, young girl, Great Khan's Imperial Court Palace, East Asia, and the Mongo princesses. Now, <clears throat> in many of the readings, that I've done, you'll rarely see Xanadu mentioned as a real place. They, they will say, they will mention Xanadu, but uh, in one of these recent pages that I read through, <clears throat> they, they, they actually mention like Kublai Khan went to Xanadu, and then in parentheses, Shandu. So uh, I just wanted to point that out because sometimes Things look like inaccuracies, but you know, listen, let's let's cut them some slack. Uh, there, the inaccuracies do jump up, and like for example, some people were saying the Mongol men, at least, weren't really short. Their upper torsos were tall; only their legs were short. Then lots of other people just say the Mongols are short people. So. You know, I'm not going to make a big deal of it. I come across inaccuracies, unless it's really crazy, like somebody says that a, an elephant is the size of a mouse, I'll, I'll, I'll probably make a few statements about that. But, uh, you know, so they show it, they're told, no. First of all, uh, they, their culture that they had then is so gone. It's, it's just so gone. It's not hardly worth talking about. But... Uh, you know, really a fabulous culture when they were at their peak, and their costumes and 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 their gamemanship and, and what they did, their hunting, and they, and they they didn't they never farmed. These people were on the hoof. That's what they were. They they lived in the saddle. Not. Nothing was going to tie them down, pin them down. This was an amazing culture, and and they didn't have any retirement programs. The old warriors, they would just get up one day and they say, eh, "I feel like I'm really old and I'm probably going to die." 
So they throw down their sword, leave the, leave the raiding party, and go back to the homeland and sit outside their yurt. And in some cases, they did that for five years, sitting out, watching the herd grazing, enjoying the last five years, the golden sunsets, the golden sky, blue sky with the golden sun, and enjoying it. They didn't wait to the last minute to retire. They also didn't wait for some government to say, okay, you're 65 now, you'll have to retire. No, they felt it in their gut. They lived by their gut, their instincts. They, they, an amazing culture, amazing. If I had to recreate myself in, in one way and one way only, it would be as a Mongol. Provided I was very close in the pecking order, real close to one of the Khans, if not, if not a grandson of Genghis Khan. You know, and, and, and let it be known that, you know, Kubla, the grandson, did eventually ascend to the throne. And he did, he did a lot of marvelous things. And maybe I'll have a chance to point some of them out to you. So <clears throat> I've gone well over what I like to go over in, as time for, uh, for these little discussions. But I think it's worth it. Listen, enjoy the rest of the day. Make sure you come back to see me for World History for Ordinary People 31. And if you like, go back and review some of the other ones. See where they tie in. Okay, great. Thank you. Bye.